You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome to the Aston Villa News Facebook page. I'm Dan Rowlandson, joined by the Midlands football editor, Matt Kendrick. Uh, Matt, are you well this morning? I am well, yeah. I'm even better for, for today's news. Um, I know you're going to ask me about it in a minute, but I'll, I'll, yeah. as usual, I'll just jump straight in and talk about it anyway. <laughs> I think it, it's an area that Villa definitely needed strengthening, and I think of the options available for Villa in terms of how much cash they've got left to spend, the calibre of player they can attract. I think it's a, a really, really shrewd deal uh, yeah. to bring Rocky market to the club. Totally agree. Um, and as always, when we make a sign-in, we look at the, the opposition side of things. So we're going to introduce Oliver Harbord to the stream. Oliver, how are you this morning? Very good, thanks guys. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Excited by this signing. Um, like I said to you off, off air, I've been watching Ross Barkey compilations on YouTube this morning to, to get myself in the mood. Um, first of all, your reaction is, from the Chelsea perspective, are you are you happy to see him go, sad to see him go? Uh, I think that, look, I think it's quite clear that Barkley wasn't really in the in the starting 11 plans. I think if you see the reaction from Chelsea fans, they're, they're a little bit disappointed because he is a decent squad player for sure. He's a guy that... Um, can play in the number eight role. He can play in the number ten role. He's quite an attacking option to bring off the bench at times, and he brings a lot of energy. and And you know he can finish. We've seen that. And so it's a it's a difficult one. But but for Frank Lampard, he's just kind of now got a squad where he's got too many players in front of him. The likes of Mason Mount, obviously bringing in Kai Havertz, Timo Werner, Hakim Ziyech, these kind of guys. There's a lot of uh, of options for him. So to see him go, I wouldn't say as a surprise, but maybe a slight disappointment because I feel like he. He still has a lot to offer and, uh, you know, he, he shows flashes and I think he's not had the consistency um, that he's kind of deserved to, to show what he can really do over time. Yeah, without looking into it too much just yet, I kind of feel like his Everton career and his Chelsea career are very different. What kind of player do you think Villa are getting? Can we see those flashes of brilliance that he, that he had when he was an Everton player and that whatever, you know, what made you spend however much it was on him in the first place? Are we going to get yeah. that, that sign in at Villa? I mean, I don't know if you remember, but obviously he was going to join Chelsea in the summer of 2017. And then he was at the training ground and he was like, kind of like the deadline day um, story, if you like, where he was at the training ground. Then he turned around and, and the deal didn't go through. They then signed him in, in that January 2018. And, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where he came back with a very, very bad injury, um, didn't play much. And then under Sarri, he didn't really have... Uh, a great amount of game time. Um, he was kind of, it was a running joke with Chelsea fans that he would come on in the 60th minute for Matteo Kovacic. And he just never really found his position. Um, I think that was that was the thing for him. I see him as a number 10, I have to say. He can play in that, obviously, midfield role. And, and it's just not really worked out for him with the consistency. He's only played, I think he started about 13 games last season. Um, but he definitely has moments. I think he, he can be a frustrating player at times, no doubt about it. You know, he will try and shoot from outside the box at least five or six times a game uh, to get ready for that. Um, but he he still, you know, he has this ability. And uh, if he's given a consistent run of games and he stays fit and injury free, then then he can definitely be a, a, a big weapon for Villa. Matt, what are your thoughts on the signing overall? Well, I, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask Ollie really kind of what kind of shape is he going to be in? Because I know he's been, I know he's been dipped, dipped in and out um, so far this season. I think he's made a couple of. Um, Premier League substitute appearances, and he, he's played. I think he played in he played the whole game, didn't he, in the Carabao Cup um, mm. early this season. Um, we know he's kind of. I suppose it's twofold, really. It's it's what kind of physical shape is he in? And we've from afar we've seen kind of question marks about his character and his attitude at times throughout his career. Are Villa getting somebody who's in a good place physically and emotionally? Well, I mean, Chelsea had have not had much of a preseason at all. I think that's uh, that's pretty clear. The fact that they, you know, and Barkley was was one of the guys as well that had to to uh, he was injured over a bit of the uh, preseason, so he's kind of not had a lot of match fitness. So I wouldn't expect him to come in and be able to play ninety minutes off the bat and give everything all the time. You talk about the character and attitude. I mean, that was one of the issues last season. He had a couple of incidents. Um, I don't know if you remember, there was the time where he was um, spoken to by the police with the fact that he was uh, kind of threw chips at a cabbie um, and he had that incident where he didn't pay his cab fee. Uh, there was another time when he was away on holiday and and he kind of was pictured kind of a bit worse for wear with his shirt off in, a, I think it was a Dubai nightclub. Um, you know, there were these moments where you were kind of like, 
mm, that's not that's not a great look. But look, I think Frank Lampard, he made some mistakes in his career and he kind of passed it off to that. I mean, he is a very good professional. I don't think we can get around that. He does, you know, he does train hard. He will work hard. And I think now he's got the chance to play regular football. Um, I think that was that's a really good one. Obviously, last season didn't work out for Danny Drinkwater at Villa as much. But I think Ross Barkley is a very different different guy. And, uh, you know, he will, if he's given regular football, I think it's just the, the loan move he needs because he was, he now 26, I believe. Um, he needs to, something to spark his career. I mean, let's not forget as well, he's a regular for England. That was the interesting thing. He didn't, he didn't, often didn't play for Chelsea, but yet would start almost every game for England. Uh, so Gareth Southgate sees something in him and likes him. And if he can continue to play well for Villa, then, then you know, that's only going to boost his sort of credentials for Euro 2021. And that's going to be a massive, um, a massive thing for him. So that's why I think Villa are getting him a, a decent time. The Ross Barkley I remember when he burst onto the scene at Everton was kind of a bit of a machine. He could kind of gobble up ground. He could be yeah. physically imposing, but he could do all that, kind of be this all-action midfielder. But he'd, he'd have like a real kind of nice little bit of kind of flair in him as well. Do you know, he could he could pick passes. Pretty much the all-round kind of modern modern midfielder. You know, is has that been coached out of him along the way? Are there still glimpses of that? Oh, there's still definitely glimpses of it. I, th- I would say that under Sarri, that was probably coached out of him a bit because it, Sarri had a very rigid 4-3-3. Um, and as I said, Barkley was fighting for one position. That was it. Obviously, Jorginho played every game at the base. Ngolo Kante played every game that he was fit on the right and it was either Barkley or Kovacic playing on the left. So, And it didn't work for him because he was he was given, as we know about Italian coaches, they like they like their systems. It was the same with Conte as well. They like the way, they like their players to be in specific and not and at times not given the freedom and, and Hazard was above him and he would, he would get all the freedom and Barkley wouldn't. I think what will be exciting to see him at Villa is just if Dean Smith gives him that freedom because if he does then he will, they will get the best out of him, I believe. If he's given the chance to play in those pockets of space, to turn and run at players, as you say, um, you know, as I said before, do be warned, he will shoot a lot when he probably shouldn't. But he still has that, that sort of ability. And I think that's, uh, that's something that if he can kind of get that back this season, then he could be a very exciting, exciting signing. If he did have a good season with Villa and Villa looked to sign him permanently, what kind of figure do you think Chelsea would be looking for? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, you could be looking at maybe, I'm going to say something around the 30 mil mark, maybe. It, it kind of depends on where the market is as well. But I think he is a player that they would look to, to sell and could sell for a decent money um, to try and raise some funds for future, for future transfers. I think that's the kind of point of this loan rather than him kind of maybe coming back into the fold next season. Can't be any worse than the last Chelsea loan we had, can it, Matt? Yeah, the bar the bar's been set set quite low. I was just, I was just gonna say, let, let's leave Drinkwater to one side. We we we, we stayed up, we recovered. Let's just, <laughs> I was gonna say Villa have been linked with Barkley and Loftus Cheek. And I know they're kind of different different people and different players, but you you tell us you 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 see these guys a lot more regularly than we've been able to to watch them. Have Villa got the best end of the bargain by by Barkley going there rather than Loftus Cheek, or, or what would you say? Yeah, I would say actually that Barkley over Loftus Cheek right now is better for Villa. Um, I think if we were talking about permanent signing, it'd be a different thing. But as a season loan, yeah, Barkley is def- uh, Barkley's in a better place right now than Loftus Cheek. Loftus Cheek, obviously, he had the, the ruptured Achilles tendon in, in 2019, in May 2019, when that stupid postseason friendly they played, which was just ridiculous. And Chelsea fans are still mad about it. Um, he didn't play for over a year. He came back when, when the Premier League returned. He played a handful of games and he's only started the one game against Brighton this year. And he looked very, very rusty. He just looks like a player that doesn't have the confidence in his body right now after that. Um, you know, leading up to that game, in, in America, he was fantastic, and he was going to. He was, you know, one of the key men for Sarri. He was going to start the Europa League final, and this season, and sorry, last season could have been his real step up season. It just hasn't worked out for him with the injury, and so Villa are definitely out of the two getting the better sort of short term option. I think if we were talking about a permanent transfer, a three four year deal, we'd be th- saying no, Loftus Cheek is the one you would want. But for now, I think Villa are definitely getting uh, the better of the two as it stands. I'm not sure it's quite a kind of. Lampard and Gerrard fitting them into the same system for England scenario. But Barkley and Jack Grealish. I know, was going to ask this. It's it's a really interesting dilemma for me because you're saying that Barkley's best position is number 10. 
Jack Grealish's best position probably <laughs> is number 10. Dean Smith doesn't tend to play with a number 10 as such. He tends to play a kind of 4-3-3. Uh, you know, and I know it's not your headache to solve, Ollie. I know that's for Dean Smith, John Terry, and uh, Craig Shakespeare to solve. But I don't know how does it <laughs> how does it work because bringing giving giving Barkley the freedom will bring out the best in, in Barkley, but giving Jack Grealish the freedom brings out the best in him. And can can Villa a team trying to consolidate? This is the longest ever question. A team trying to consolidate in the Premier League can they afford? to give two players the, the freedom like that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that Barkley has played a lot in the number eight role in that sort of um, midfield three. He has played over the last few seasons. I mean, Lampard, for example, last season preferred the 4-3-3 for most of the campaign. Um, and Barkley, again, would play sort of in that left or right of the, of the three. And actually, when he looked best last season, there was a, there was a time just before the, the break, actually, where they, they beat Liverpool in the FA Cup and then they beat Everton really convincingly 4-0 where it was uh, Kante holding and Mason Mount on one side of the three and, and Barkley on the right. And and because Kante is such a good defensive midfielder and such a good player in that midfield, it gave Mount and and Barkley a bit more freedom than maybe they would usually get. Um, and so he can play in that role. I mean, I like I, I always think he's at his best when he does have that freedom, obviously. And that is going to be a conundrum, as you say, for Villa going forward. And you can't just let everyone have freedom and it's, it's all over the place. But... Um, you know, I do think that you know he does have the ability to play in a midfield three, um, but you you know you want to see him on the ball and running at players and being aggressive and attacking more than you want to see him holding back and and sort of playing from from the defence and out of his own box. I don't think that's where he's, he's best suited. See, I mentioned at the start that I've been watching YouTube compilations of his time at Chelsea and Everton this morning, which I know is a terrible way to judge a footballer. Obviously, obviously I've seen Ross Barkley, but I just wanted a bit of a, a refresher. And a lot of his Everton clips, he was running from deep, more like a number eight than a number 10, and, and mm. running through players a lot like we've seen Jack Grealish do. Uh, so, Matt, I'm looking at the Villa lineup now. There's a few, few comments saying, how will we line up with him? Will he come straight in? You would assume he comes straight in in the place of Conor Harrahan on that left-hand side of the midfield three. Douglas Louise, John McGinn. Barkley as a three and Grealish on the left wing still. That's an exciting proposition, isn't it? Barkley and Grealish linking up, drifting out on that side, running past players. I think so. And I don't want to bore the Chelsea fans who are, who are tuning into the Chelsea <laughs> Facebook live too much. But... So I, I bore them all the time anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> then, at least you bore them with relevant things. Um, <laughs> central midfield for Villa has been an issue since God knows when. You know, I've had James Milner for a while who flourished before he was poached by um, Man City but Villa's midfield now seems in the best shape that I can remember for a yeah. long time I'm talking about a generation to be honest yeah. and you know nice problems to have you've got Jack Grealish you've got Douglas Louise who started to to show his quality in there you've got John McGinn I know it's a, only a very narrow sample but John McGinn looked a lot more like the John McGinn that we know um, at Fulham and, and now you've got Ross Barkley, who, like I said, it might be kind of nostalgia and, and rose-tinted specs, but I remember him being this real kind of physical, all-action, kind of powerful midfielder. And then you've got Conor Hurrahan, who can't get into that team now and has started the season really well and has got a kind of wonderful left foot for, for whenever he's needed. You've got Jacob Ramsey, who's the next cab off the rank from, from Bodymore Heath. So, you know... There's been an issue with Villa fans, and I think it probably was the Danny Drinkwater example. And if we go back a little bit further, these people like Jermaine Genus has been a lone flop, and and Grant Holt has been a lone flop, and I'm sure there's so many other examples. Villa fans are a little bit kind of not against the loan rule, but don't like the idea of loaning people's players and making them better. You know, you know, improving other people's players and handing them back. That's why the like Tammy Abraham. Well, but, but there is there's good examples, isn't there? There's Robbie Keane, there's, there's, there's Tammy Abraham, there's Axel Twanzebe. And I think the thing that will encourage people, Villa fans listening to this and probably pre perhaps annoy Chelsea fans is you perhaps offering that glimmer that this could become something more permanent, you know, if, if, if Barkley is a success. So I think I think from a, a Villa fan's point of view, let's hope the guy stays fit. Let's hope, hope Dean Smith solves that conundrum with how to play him him and um, him and Grealish together. It's funny, you know, because Mason Mount, and he's a great player, Mason Mount has kind of almost kind of taken on this kind of evil quality amongst Villa fans because 
when when Jack when when Gareth Southgate is ever asked about Jack Grealish, he always refers to Mason Mount first. I think from a Villa point of view, I think it, it's heading towards a really really encouraging transfer window. I think I think Villa are, are nearly there. If we're being greedy, you might want a, a bit more cover at left back. Um, potentially another winger, but I don't think we can afford to be that greedy. I think I'm, from a Villa point of view, I'm really, really pleased with today's business. Obviously, Ollie, you'll know all about Jack Grealish. Obviously, everyone knows what kind of qualities he's got. Obviously, getting in that England squad now as well. Do I want to say obviously again? Um, you've seen a lot of Ross Barkley as well. Do you think from the outside looking in, those two can flourish in a side together? Or will they both yeah. kind of want to both try and beat everyone on their own? Yeah, I mean, as you were saying about the, the system, I think that that's... Uh, that's definitely something that that ha, um, you know Barkley had under Sarri a bit, where he did have you know the likes of Eden Hazard, who was the talisman for Chelsea on his left. So he's used to that sort of dynamic, if you like. Um, I think Barkley will probably feel like he um, he should have a bit more status within the, the Villa squad, if you if you like. You know, he's always kind of been one of those fringe players at Chelsea, where he's he's always been on the cusp of the first team of starting eleven never really progressed into a, a full-blown starter week in, week out. Some of that does have to do with injuries as well. I mean, that is kind of one thing that that could be a potential concern. You know, we know that he's had injuries throughout his career. Um, so let's, let's hope, he, you know, he gets a, a good full, clean season. Um, I, I still think they can thrive together. Yeah, I mean, good players want to play with good players, right? They, they, they bring out the best of each other at times. Um, and I think that that's, you know, as you say, that could be the dilemma for, for Smith, where they all fit in. But if it does work out, especially, as you say, on that left-hand side with Grealish and Barkley, it could be a really dynamic thing. I think one thing that Barkley will be looking to improve is probably his final third productivity. You know, last season, he did start 13 games. I think he had another seven or eight off the bench in the Premier League. But he only got one goal and four assists. And that's not really good enough for a player who is attacking, you know, with an attacking edge rather than defensive one. So I think that's something that he will be looking to improve. Um, and and that's something that Chelsea want want to see. If he's going to ever work his way back into the Chelsea squad, I think that's kind of something that, because as we know, you know, his time at Everton, it was about scoring goals. I think he had eight assists and eight goals in one of his years at Everton, and he's never reached that level at Chelsea. Um, but maybe he can do again with with more regular football. Because as I say, he's been very much a bit part player. Um, very rarely finished sort of ninety minutes if he did start as well. So. Uh, that that could be an exciting one, but yeah, I can see I can see Grealish and Barkley working well, and and I have to say actually for Villa, I, I you know if I was uh, sort of teams that were kind of going to be battling it out for relegation, I'd be very worried about what Villa have done this year. They look like they've done some decent business in this summer, quietly gone about some good business, and uh, Barkley can can definitely add to that. I think. Matt, people talking about Villa's system in the comments saying that Jack Grealish has to come back inside now because he's he's not as good on the left. Is it possible to fit McGinn, Louise, Barkley and Jack centrally? It's weird, you know, because kind of naturally you think Jack Grealish sh- should play down the middle and he can affect games more. But people are saying that's his best position. He's played the bulk of the last season from the left yeah. and it hasn't hit him whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying he couldn't be even better if he played as a, as a number 10. But if you're trying to bring in a lesser striker alongside Ollie Watkins just so that you can bring Jack Grealish into the centre when you've now got lots of central options then yeah. it, it seems that it seems like you're creating a problem that's 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 not there for me um so I think it's kind of if it ain't broke don't fix it I think Jack probably would over time see himself as a as a number 10 but he still affects games massively um from you know from from the left wing um, I think you look at those midfield three, you'd have Douglas Louise, McGinn, Barkley would be a three, and then Jack could be a 10 with maybe Troy or Ray next to Watkins. And you need your fullback to push on, which you know might not be the best idea, leaving us open at the back. It feels like Barkley, McGinn, and Grealish would all want to be doing the same thing, all playing centrally. They're all going to want to carry the ball forward, they're all going to want to burst into space. Surely they can't all do that. So just leaving Jack out on the left to do his own thing, that makes more sense. It looks like a pretty impressive kind of midfield and forward six to me. The six yeah. that you just like I say, Douglas Louise kind of anchoring and then then McGinn and, and Barkley kind of patrolling and, and you know, almost kind of covering each other, giving one licence to go and one licence to sit. And then a front three of Grealish, Ollie Watkins and Bert Bertrand Traore. If you compare and contrast that with what we had for a large periods of last season, people would have absolutely ripped your arm off for yeah. that six weeks ago. 
Um, so, like I said, these are really, really, really nice dilemmas for, for Dean Smith to have that he wouldn't have imagined. You know, the last time that, that Villa played Chelsea at the, the back end of, well, you know, during restart, he wouldn't have dreamed that that, that he would have had this kind of embarrassment of riches. So, I'd leave I'd leave as is with with Jack for now and, and and just try and find a way of getting Barkley into that team and getting him kind of firing. He adds a bit of height into the midfield as well. I think he's six foot one, six foot two, something like that. I've seen McGinn and Douglas Louise are both what five seven or five eight or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm absolutely guessing now. Obviously, kind of Harahan dropping it out uh, dropping out of that side is a, a loss for set pieces. Um, did Barkley take many set pieces for Chelsea, Oli, or would there have been better players in the Chelsea yeah. side then? No, he was always one of the guys lining up to take uh, free kicks, especially. He always, you know, uh, fancied himself as a bit of a free kick specialist. But, you know, they had um, the, the likes of Willian last season and Mason Mount obviously coming in, Ruth James, guys with great technique. And, you know, this year he wouldn't have been much on it as well with the likes of Hakim Ziyech and Kai Havertz coming in and, and taking it. But he definitely does. He's, he's also a decent penalty taker as well. Um, you know, he missed a pretty big one against Valencia in the, uh, which was a strange one. He kind of, came on as a sub and then took a penalty almost straight away and missed it, which is his one big blemish. But he's also a very good penalty taker as well. So he does have that option with him. But yeah, he definitely fancies himself as a set piece. He didn't take many corners last season. Um, as you say, he's kind of quite a big presence to have in the box. He's a physical presence as well. So, you know, generally when you're attacking corners, he's quite a decent one to have in there. But definitely from free kicks around the box, he's a guy that will that can be a decent option because he has got very good technique on free kicks. Uh, so my one final question, Matt, is about the Villa squad now and our expectations for the season. Obviously, we did our predictions before the start of the season and when we were still a few transfers short uh, at that stage, I think we both said 16th and 15th, or something like that. If I read out to you the start 11 now and you've got Martinez, Cash, Consa, Mings and Target, Douglas Louise, McGinn and Barkley, Traore on the right, Watkins and Grealish on the left... That'd be criminal, wouldn't it, if that side is in a relegation battle this season? Yeah, you know me, I'm a natural-born pessimist, so I'm not going to revise my prediction, um, <laughs> which I think was 15th or 16th. Um, but yeah, it, it, it looks like... It, to me, it's all about kind of evolution, and it looks like a squad that is trying to take that next step to consolidation. You know, it was dramatic, wasn't it? But last season was just get over the line, however way you could drag, you know crawl over by your fingertips. This looks like that the Villa are, are starting to build, um, which is exciting because I don't think Villa, probably since, we're probably talking a decade, since O'Neill left, maybe early Julia and when they signed Darren Bent, I don't think Villa have been able to look that, that further up the table. I think it's always been kind of damage limitation and, and, and survival. So it, it fills me with encouragement. I've said this many times before. As long as Villa can be safe by March rather than August um, <laughs> next season, then then I'll, I'll take that. And I think if Ross Barkley can, even if Ross Barkley is brilliant and get, helps Villa up a couple of places in the table and Chelsea think, actually, we, can, we quite like him, that, that'll be good enough for me. And I know we'll, we'll have made a, a player better, improved another club's player, but if Villa, if the byproduct of that is Villa consolidating, then... I'll take that all day long. I definitely think there are, there are worse squads out there than, than what you've just said about Villa. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Fulham right now are looking like they could be in a real scrap. The likes of, I know they had a decent first half against Chelsea, but West Brom potentially as well. Um, you know, West Ham, again, uh, are really kind of struggling this window. And if, if Chelsea do nab Declan Rice away from them, then they're really going to struggle. So for, for Villa, I mean, I would, I would be more positive than anything else right now. I think that they... You know, have got a good situation if they can keep injury free as well. Obviously, that's always key. Um, you know, you, you lose a couple of those from the lineup and, and the squad depth as well. You have to be be careful with. But I, I would say that yeah, there's there's no reason why uh, Villa can't be looking uh, more positive than last season. And as you say, should should be more secure earlier than they were last year because I think they've they're definitely building a, a decent squad. Next time you speak to Frank Lampard at his press conference, could you thank him heartily from Villa fans for his generosity? <laughs> The, except with any drink water with generosity with Tony, Tony Abraham and Ross Barkley he probably did owe it Villa fans because he used to score so regularly against us <laughs> um, but if, as long as he keeps sending us decent players uh, back up to the Midlands then we'll forgive him all those to, goals to be fair I think we got I think we got the best
best out of Frank Lampard when he was Derby manager, didn't we? Getting promotion in the, into the Premier League ahead of him. So we'll thank him for that instead. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm surprised he's willing to give you players after that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Good shout. Um, well, well, I'll let you both go. It's a really enjoyable half an hour chat looking at uh, both sides, obviously, here on Facebook Live, but also for our Claret and Blue podcast. I'll, I'll cut down the, the Ross Barkley stuff. So thanks, Ollie, for, for giving us the lowdown on our, our new low knee. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa. Up the villa.